Good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Learning from Sugar Sweetened Beverage Tax Evaluations in Mexico, South America, and the US to Reverse Childhood Obesity. This is a spe special session sponsored by NCOR, the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research. And in addition to all of you lovely ladies and gentlemen in the audience here in the room with us, we have, I think, more than 200 or several hundred joining us on a live stream. So that's a reminder when you do your questions at the end to please speak into the microphone. Um, I'm going to moderate this panel. Um, my name is Lori Dorfman. I hail from Berkeley, California, which I'm excited to be from, I'll tell you in just a second. I direct the Berkeley Media Studies Group, part of the Public Health Institute. And this is a very exciting panel, particularly if you're from Berkeley. You see that green dot on the map there. You know, like, like many Americans, I'm kind of on the ethnocentric side. So I start with where I live and make that really big on the map. And that's the green dot in Berkeley, which is the first town, really, in our nation to have a soda tax. And you're going to hear from our panelists more about what that is, what that means, and what's happening across the world. We were really excited in Berkeley when we um, made this happen. and. Um, and it's starting to catch on. There are other places that are trying it. The uh, yellow dots on my map are things that are pending. The red dots are attempts that have failed. But those failures are important because they represent a, a, a motion, a movement. And every time this issue is in the news, it means more people learn about it. They understand it. They're starting to hear the arguments about why it's important. And it's really gratifying to see what's happening across the globe. Because you can see there are far more green dots across the globe than in the US. So I'm very eager to learn from our colleagues around the country, because I think we're on the edge of something where we'll start to see this picture of a little child looking eagerly up at a soda vending machine look almost as strange as this picture. And so that's what we're hoping for. Our panelists are going to tell us about this process and what's going on around the world. We're going to hear first from Shu Wen. Each one of them will introduce themselves and tell you where they're from and what they're going to talk about. Then we'll hear from Lynn and then Steve. We're all on a first name basis here. And then Mauricio will be our discussant to pull it all together. And after that, we will have some questions and answers. I'll, each speaker will have 10 minutes. I'll have a little alarm on my magic phone that will go off, and then you know I'll stare at them until they're done. And then we'll have questions and answers. So let me invite Shu Wen up to take to take us to the next. I'll get you up. Voila. Thank you, Lori. Uh, so I'm Shu Wen Ung from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the Department of Nutrition. Um, and today I'm going to talk, I'm going to start off this panel by talking about sugar sweetened beverage taxes as a policy tool and then give the example of Mexico. What do I, do I use this to go to mix? Okay. So, so why tax sugar sweetened beverages? Um, you know, the a strong argument are, is that sugar sweetened beverages are basically just liquid calories with little or very little redeeming um, nutritional qualities besides energy and sugar. Um, and the idea is to try to lower demand for these sort of beverages. Um, but it's also important to consider what other effects a sugar sweetened beverage tax might have with regards to the consumption of other beverages. And then also, how about foods? Um, SSB taxes, the, the response to SSB taxes could also be quite variable and heterogeneous. For example, lower income households or individuals may respond very differently. And theory, economic theory suggests that they should be more responsive. Um, and they could also vary based on the level of consumption. So higher consumers, on one hand, may be less price sensitive, i.e. respond less, due to potential habituation to certain products like sugar sweetened beverages. But on the other hand, they may also reduce more in absolute terms because they're consuming such high, high levels to begin with. Um, the response may also vary quite a bit between adults or children, and so that's useful to also analyze these sort of differences. And lastly, SSB taxes provide a potential source of revenue for governments, and how they use that revenue can also be very important and could be used towards obesity prevention efforts. Um, so what qualifies as a sugar sweetened tax working? 
And I think a lot of this depends on the objectives of having this text in the first place. And whether these objectives are long-term versus short-term objectives, what kind of a time horizon are we talking about? Um, and we, are we willing to provide it to do this evaluation and determine if it's successful or not? Um, are we looking at social welfare? So the total or subpopulation specific um, changes and impacts? Is it meant to also potentially encourage industry to reformulate their products to either sell or market um, the less unhealthy products? Um, and is the goal to just reduce SSB consumption or to re improve diet quality overall? Um, and I mentioned already the objective for some governments to use this to raise revenue. Um, and then the question comes up is how do you use this revenue? And of course, hopefully an overarching goal is to improve or at least limit the deterioration of health outcomes. So in designing a sugar sweetened beverage tax, I think there are a number of things to consider. Um, and I list a, a bunch of them <laughs> here. Um, some of the things to consider include the beverage industry's market power within the area that you're considering. So whether or not they have, um, if, if it's a perfect competition, there are a lot of different companies in that market and competing, um, or it's dominated by a very select few companies. That could affect things like the degree in which the tax is passed on to prices. Um, where it's levied um, or seen by consumers can also matter. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the differences between an excise versus a sales tax. So this design is also important. Um, and then the type of tax, if it's a percentage base, the ad valorem, or a fixed amount in terms of per unit can matter. Is the tax um, designed based on, you know, determined based on food groups or beverage groups or nutrients or some combination of the two is also important to consider. Um, what level of, should the tax be set at in order to truly have some kind of a meaningful impact? And then, of course, elasticities of demand in terms of, in, in economic terms, own and cross-price elasticities as well. Income el elasticities will determine who, quote unquote, bears the cost of this tax. Um, and the scope of coverage matters as well. Lynn will later talk about Berkeley example, which is a very local level example, and I will later very soon be talking about a national tax in Mexico. Um, and then in the case of a local level, there's some potential for what we call leakage or cross-border purchasing. Um, implementation of the tax itself is also critical to consider who is gonna collect it and enforce the tax. How do you define what items are taxed and identify them in a store? Um, I mentioned already the use of the revenue, which ties in with efforts to pass these taxes, um, is it your marked or not? And then again, short-term versus long-term goals, and of course, social and political um, acceptance of considering a sugar sweet and beverage tax, and so the timing issue is of course critical as well. So I'm gonna move on now to talk about the Mexico example. Um, so this sugar sweet and beverage tax was implemented starting January 1st of 2014 at a one peso per liter level as an excise tax. Um, it was a national tax, so obviously there was no control. We don't have a second in Mexico. Um, and so we had to figure out a, an evaluation approach that worked around this. So for our first question was, did the price pass through, did the price increase the level of one peso per liter, right? Um, and studies done by Dr. Arancha Cochero and the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico found that yes, it did, but it was heterogeneous. It wasn't uniform consistent across all beverage types or across different geographical areas. So the urban areas and the rural areas had different levels of pass-through for different types of sugar sweetened beverages. And then we looked at the pre-post comparison of purchases um, using observational data. And the thing with beverages that we have to always keep in mind is that there's seasonality in um, both the prices of sugar sweetened beverages as well as the purchases of these beverages. And then also to, um, to keep in mind is that in Mexico, there was a concurrent 8% tax on non-essential energy dense foods. Um, of course, there were also a number of other concurrent changes that could have occurred since the tax was implemented, including the economic conditions and consumer preferences. So our main goal here was then to determine whether there were significant changes in the trends of beverages purchased during the post-tax period compared to the pre-tax period after adjusting for household composition and a number of other contextual factors. 
Um, so just to keep this simple, I just want to provide a graphical illustration of how we are doing this. Basically, so the black solid line shows the trends in purchases of sugar sweetened beverages or beverages um, prior to the tax. And so you see sort of a, a trend with the, the first diff, diff one, showing that slope. And then we use that to project out into the post-tax period to see what it looked like, the black dotted line. Um, and then from our analysis, we then looked at what the post-tax values were, the red line, and compared the slope from the red line to the slope in the black dotted line, right? And, the, and this is essentially what we call a diff and diff approach, because we're looking at the differences in two differences. Okay. Um, so the main outcome we found, this was, a, this was a paper that was published in the British Medical Journal that came out in January of this year. We found that on average, the purchases of sugar-sweetened beverages fell by 6% compared to the counterfactual in 2014. Um, and so that, that works out to be roughly 12 milliliters per capita per day. Um, and the decline was more, more pronounced among the low SES households, lower income households, and that was about a 9% reduction or 19 milliliters per capita per day difference. At the same time, um, purchases of the untaxed beverages, particularly bottled water, rose. Um, so what do these findings suggest? We found that basically the urban, the average urban household in Mexico's own price elasticity for sugar sweetened beverages was about minus 0 .0, 0 0.6. And for low SES households, this was even greater at minus 0.9. There were some substitutions towards bottled water. And in some ways, the act of instituting a tax is a signal to consumers. Our findings are actually quite robust. There have been a number of other studies that have been done recently that, that was funded by um, the food industry in Mexico, and they found basically the same results in terms of the reductions of sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, so taxes appear, in the case of Mexico, to, you know, to be able to dampen the demand for SSBs and can shift demands towards healthier alternatives. However, I, I do actually think that this may not be enough to turn things around. Um, some of the other things that we're going to be looking um, into with additional years of this data is to look at the heterogeneous response by consumers between the high versus the low purchasing households, as well as households with children versus households without children, because as I mentioned earlier, there could be variability in response. We're also very interested in looking at potential habit formation um, over time as this tax continues to be implemented um, and how consumers adjust in terms of their response to this tax over time. Besides the consumer response, I think it's also very important to consider how industry responds to this tax. Um, one of the things that they've already tried to do has, is to lobby for a lower tax rate for the lower sugar options um, of products. Um, they're, on the other hand, they could also be starting to do some reformulations, which is an area of work that we're going to look into as well. Um, in addition, these companies produce all sorts of products of, of all kinds of different package size versions, right? So they could cost shift um, in terms of moving the burden of the tax to other types of beverages that are not necessarily sugar-sweetened beverages, and also um, transfer the tax um, in, in varying degrees by package sizes of beverages. Um, we're also looking at their marketing strategies and how they're evolving over time. And lastly, I think it's very important to try to track how the revenue from this tax is being used, um, and, and our collaborators at the National Institute of Public Health is doing that. Um, and then I want to put the context of this 12, average of the 12 milliliters per capita per day in context. You'll see that the decline in the SSB consumption in Mexico is actually very small relative to the growth in earlier years. Likewise, we see a similar story in the U.S., not due to attacks, but the recent declines that people have been talking about. Um, and you'll see in the red line is the regular carbonated soft drinks, which is one type of sugar sweetened beverage, increasing over time. Um, my team is also involved in the evaluation of other sugar sweetened beverage taxes, um, including the work in Berkeley that Lynn will be presenting, and also in Chile. I'm not going to go into details about what your tax is, but Suffice to say that there's, as Laurie pointed out, increasing um, you know, locations that are implementing sugar sweetened beverage taxes and they need to be evaluated and there is a need to build an evidence base to 
consider all the different designs and policy tools and how they work together. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Lynn. And we're going to hold our questions till the end. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, you may have <laughs> <clears throat> I'm shorter. Okay. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon with all of you. Um, and like Lori, I live in Berkeley. Um, I work as a senior advisor at the Public Health Institute, uh, particularly on issues of chronic disease and obesity. And I've started working on soda tax when New York State, uh, when we lobbied for it in New York State in 2009 and 2010. And it's a theme that seems to have pursued me for some time. And it was incredibly gratifying to finally work on one that passed. Um, so I'm going to talk about the evaluation, which is a joint evaluation between the Public Health Institute and the University of North Carolina um, of the Berkeley soda tax. And this is preliminary interim data on the first six months of the tax in relation to price, sales, and revenue. And I have no conflicts to declare. <clears throat> As Lori pointed out, this is an idea whose time is coming. And it's spreading rapidly across the world. Um, and has, but it's been a mix of failures and successes. There have been very strong uh, campaigns against it. There have been, I think, close to 60 efforts in the United States. And Berkeley was the first to pass. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing countries adopting these taxes and adopting them with different rates of taxations and different styles of taxation. So it's a very complex uh, scenario out there to, to understand the impact. And one thing that we're seeing is that robust evaluation work is really quite scarce, um, which is why the work in Mexico and, and this work seems so important to us. Specifically, in 2014, we had two proposed soda taxes in the Bay Area, in San Francisco and in Berkeley. And we felt that this was really a unique opportunity for time-sensitive, high-quality research if one of these passed. Um, there were some differences between these two proposals. Berkeley proposed a one cent per ounce tax. San Francisco proposed a two cent per ounce tax. Um, and these were not principal discussions. I think all of us like the idea of the, more, the higher taxes, so it was really a political, what can we get through? Um, Berkeley's was a general tax, and California has the unusual trait of being a state where to pass any tax locally, it has to go to the voters. A general tax in California requires a 50% vote. A dedicated tax requires a 66% vote. So these were two different political decisions. Uh, Berkeley had very, very strong grassroots support from all kinds of organizations across the community. San Francisco had strong political support, maybe quite, not quite as extensive grassroots support. Um, Berkeley actually had some support from the business community, and much of the community was neutral. Uh, in San Francisco, the industry was able to organize some business opposition. Um, and Berkeley is 117,000 relatively affluent, very progressive people. Um, and San Francisco is a larger, more diverse, more complex city. So these are just some scenes from the campaign. On the left is uh, the people who are working on the campaign, going door to door. The, um, steps of City Hall, and on the right is what we saw, which was a very intensive campaign by the industry, which spent over $12 million in the Bay Area to defeat these proposals. And they plastered every uh, subway station. Uh, they called every house God knows how many times. It got to the point where people felt harassed uh, during the campaign, which actually helped us. But this is the floor of a subway station in Berkeley during the campaign uh, purchased by the soda industry. What happened? Uh, the initiative passed with a surprising margin in Berkeley of 76% of the electorate. It passed with a majority in San Francisco, but that was insufficient to pass it, so it actually failed, even though it got a majority vote. In Berkeley, it was originally supposed to be implemented January 1st. Uh, that was delayed until March 1st for the large distributors, and only in September did they announce that they were delaying until January of this year implementation with small, what they call self-distributors, the guy who takes his truck to Costco, buys Coke, and puts it in his store. <clears throat> but essentially, this was the first substantial excise tax proposal implemented in the United States. So these were our research questions. Was the tax passed on to consumers? And if so, was it passed on differentially to the tax beverages? Did consumers purchase less of the tax beverages? Did residents consume less of sugar-sweetened beverages? How was the tax implemented? Did store revenue or sales change? Did people go shop somewhere else? And how much money came to the city? The ones in black we are not addressing in this presentation. Um, they're part of another part of the survey, the study. 
We had four components to this research. Again, uh, we're not presenting today, a random digit dial telephone survey, population-based telephone survey of uh, dietary intake. We analyzed prices for a panel of 68 beverages in 26 stores of varying types, which was also similar to a study done by UC Berkeley team, which had similar results, Jen Falby and Chris Madsen. Um, we are carrying out an analysis of retail transactions in two large chains with three of Berkeley's nine large groceries um, from 2013 through the end of the first year. And lastly, another project that's joint with UC Berkeley, qualitative interviews with stakeholders. So this is the timeline, and today's presentation is focusing on these six months of the first uh, implementation, although our data collection goes back to 2013, and our study ends, um, but not presented today, in February of 2016. So the 26 store study had um, over 1,100 prices on 68 beverage products um, in stores of different types. This initial comparison was December 2014 baseline to June 2015. Um, and we had large supermarkets, independent markets, corner stores, gas stations, pharmacies, and so on. Uh, these are price changes not weighted by sales. What we saw was full pass-through or greater on tax beverages in large chain supermarkets, small chain supermarkets, and chain gas stations. As you can see, these values are all above the one cent per ounce of the tax. We saw partial pass-through in chain pharmacies and no pass through in the independent small markets and independent gas stations. Recalling that the uh, application of the tax to small self distributors had not yet gone into effect at the time of this data collection. The second part of the study was collection of retail scanner data from two large groceries. We asked all groceries in Berkeley to collaborate and many small stores. We only got two uh, large chains to collaborate with us. <clears throat> so this data is based on their data. Um, we had three stores in Berkeley and six stores as comparisons um, from the Bay Area, uh, and we categorized those into three zones, neighboring stores, a little further away, and quite a bit uh, further away. This data covered over 14 million customer transactions, um, with over 6 million transactions, including what we're calling best study beverages, and over 100 million product uh, purchases. And there were a series of exclusions that I won't get into uh, here. The first question was price changes from this data, and our key outcome was average real price in cents per ounce of each beverage from each store per month using a fixed effect model. And this is what we saw. Um, and it was pretty striking. So where it goes way up, that's the tax going into effect. Unweighted tax pass through was 0.7 cents per ounce for tax products, and the change was not significant for the untaxed products. Uh, using sales weighting, it was 0.9 cents per ounce, which would be almost complete pass-through. Uh, sodas and energy drinks had complete pass-through. Other products had less pass-through. And the smaller the product size, the greater the pass-through. So it's, it was a pretty striking um, pass-through of the price. The second question we asked is, what happened to sales? Um, and our key uh, variable was volume of taxed beverages per transaction and untaxed beverages. And for revenue, it was average daily revenue per transaction from all types of sales. And we did, uh, basically, I won't describe this. It's the same methodology that Xu Wen just described of creating a counterfactual prediction and comparing uh, performance to that. Uh, this is a first thing just to show you that in Berkeley, we started out with very low sugar sweetened beverage um, consumption and even lower untaxed beverage consumption. So Berkeley's level of ounces of SSB's purchase per transaction was like half of um, the other stores in the surrounding region. And even for untaxed beverages, it was lower. So this is a low SSB consuming city. Then we asked the question, what happened to the sales of tax beverages? And in relation to the counterfactual, they fell by 8.5% um, in Berkeley. And sales went up in the comparison uh, stores, and it seems to be related to geography, so it went up most markedly in stores neighboring Berkeley, uh, to a lesser extent a little further away, and actually declined in stores much further away. So there does seem to be some shifting of purchases to neighboring stores, um, but nevertheless we had an 8.5 percent decline. When you look at untaxed beverages, we had an increase in relation to the counterfactual of 2.4 percent in Berkeley. Um, and also a small increase um, in the neighboring stores as well. Although again, greater in neighboring areas and less further away. Um, so a 
decrease in tax beverages and an um, increase in untaxed beverages. And then when you put all beverages together, so if you ask the question, well, did beverage sales go down? Very interestingly, we saw no decline in Berkeley in the overall sales of beverages. Um, so there was a shift from taxed to untaxed, but this was essentially not bad for business. Um, there was no overall change in beverage sales. Um, it went up slightly outside of Berkeley, and it basically stayed the same in Berkeley. Um, so looking at revenue, and I, I think I'm going to skip the methodology. We can come back to this if people have questions. Um, but the next question was, did stores make less money? And what we found was, interestingly, there was a slight decline in revenue per transaction for all stores in Berkeley and in the comparison area. The decline was less in Berkeley stores. Um, so this, it was a statistically significant reduction in all areas. The Berkeley reduction was um, 19 cents less than the reduction in the comparison stores. So our conclusion was that the tax did not affect store revenue. Revenue to the city. What happened to the city? Basically, in this very low SSB consuming cities, uh, city, in the early months of the tax, prior to the implementation with the self-distributors, tax revenue was a dollar per capita per month, or $12 per capita per year. How many of you have heard of the Federal Prevention and Public Health Fund? Right? How much is it? It's $3 per capita per year for every American right now. So this is roughly four times the value of the Prevention and Public Health Fund. And what actually gets to California is about $1. Um, so, you know, using this, even in a very low consuming city, generates significant potential revenue um, for um, societal goals. In the case of Berkeley, the advisory committee has been directing how that money is being used, and it is going to nutrition and prevention. So, summarizing, was the tax passed on to consumers, and if so, to tax beverages? The answer was yes. Um, it was passed on, depending on whether you use weighted or unweighted values, 68 to 90 percent um, in the retail scanner data, and above 1 percent in certain store groups, but not all store groups. Did consumers purchase less? Yes, about 8.5 percent less in relation to the counterfactual. Did store revenue change? No, not more than in controls. Did people shop somewhere else? Uh, there was a little bit of leakage to neighboring communities, but not enough to, de to decrease overall beverage sales in the community. And it raised about $1 per capita per month. Some of the limitations on the study, we couldn't account for other factors and things that were going on that may have confounded these results. Um, we had scanner data only for two chains of the six large grocery chains in the city, so we can't generalize um, across all stores. Um, there were a number of media campaigns that went on, both preceding the campaign and then for and against during the campaign that may have influenced consumption patterns. And we can't say if the changes were because of what the distributors were doing, what the retailers were doing, or what the consumers were doing. Um, we can't give clear attribution of those changes. Um, we continued this data collection and will shortly be finalizing the results for the first year of the tax. So in summary, in these chains, where um, interim six-month results showed that the tax was mostly passed on um, and on to the tax beverages. Sales of unhealthy beverages went down and healthier beverages went up. Total beverage sales stayed the same and stores did not lose money. So I would call this a home run. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the team, um, Xu Wen, responsible for the modeling analyses. And I'd like to thank the collaborating grocers and businesses, which were very, very important in this work, um, and really supported us by donating the data. And we uh, were funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you. You can clap again. So thank you. Um, I'm Steve Gortmaker. Um, my voice is a couple octaves lower than normal, so I'll be drinking while here. I actually feel fine, but I just have a very lower voice, and I, it's kind of an out-of-body experience. Um, so I'm going to talk about joint work that uh, I've been doing with my colleague uh, Mauricio Hernandez and the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico to simulate the population impact of their uh, sugar-sweetened uh, beverage excise tax. 
Um, we have a couple of teams here, our choices team at Harvard, the team at INSP. Um, our Harvard team has published a couple of papers already to model out the population health effects in the United States of a sugar sweetened beverage excise tax of one cent per ounce like uh, what was passed in Berkeley. And uh, that was published in um, the American Journal of Preventive Medicine last summer. There are uh, five papers. Uh, Michael Long leads of George Washington University here leads the sugar sweetened beverage paper. And then we did a health affairs paper with a micro simulation model. So these are two different models and what we've done here with the, uh, this project is use our cohort uh, simulation model. We're uh, very thankful for our funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the JPV Foundation. There's not a lot of money out there to do this type of work. So thank you very much to our funders. Um, what we're doing here is to, again, look at the health effects uh, to apply our model that we've uh, developed at Harvard over about the last eight years to the Mexico context with our colleagues there to estimate the impact of the SSB tax on changes in BMI and obesity rates in Mexico and simulate the future health care costs and morbidity and mortality due to the tax um, interventions. Um, I'm walking through this closely, or quickly, so I won't be spending a lot of time on slides. It's a close cohort model, a simulation model of the 2015 population followed for uh, 10 years. And we're looking at what we call um, short-term outcomes on BMI, <clears throat> and then uh, longer-term outcomes on uh, the incidence of nine diseases, and then um, mortality and morbidity and healthcare costs, as well as disability-adjusted life years and quality-adjusted life years. And again, this is what we've done in our papers in American Journal of Preventive Medicine for the United States. Um, for modeling our work in the U.S., we use data on health care cost and the excess cost associated with um, individuals, both children and adults, with obesity. Um, for youth, um, there's just a small difference, maybe a couple hundred dollars per year in the United States. Um, across the life course, however, these different well, these differences become quite large. In the United States, it's estimated at more than $68,000. Um, and this is an area where we've been working with the data in Mexico to come up with some relative estimates of health care costs. I'll talk about that in a minute. In adapting the model with our Mexican colleagues, and again, this has been a joint effort with these regular phone calls and back and forth, for quite a while now, we've um, the census mortality data from the uh, government, the BMI and the SSB uh, consumption data from national uh, surveillance data in Mexico. It's almost like this has been the easiest part of the project. Um, quite good quality data are collected in Mexico, and that's gone along pretty quickly. The disease epidemiology, the outcome of diseases, their incidence um, and prevalence has taken longer, but I think we have reasonable estimates of all these different nine outcomes. The healthcare cost estimates have been more difficult uh, to estimate, and so we'll have to come up with um, rough estimates, and I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, it's interesting to look at the patterns of sugar-sweetened beverage um, consumption in the United States. Uh, here's data from that we use in the um, American Journal of Preventive Medicine papers in the U.S. Uh, you see these big trends, um, gender-specific trends in the United States increasing so that uh, during those uh, teenage and, and young adult years, you have uh, young males consuming maybe 260, 270 kcals per day of sugar water. Um, yes, that's why we have a bit of an obesity problem in this country. That's a large part of it. Um, the numbers are not as large for women, but they're still stunning in many ways. And then when we look at the data from Mexico, you still see, and these data are just for the taxed sugar-sweetened beverages. This emits a number of beverages that aren't uh, manufactured in the same way so that uh, they can be easily taxed. And the numbers are still quite high. You have the 200 kcals per day. Um, 
and again, uh, lower for women, but this same pattern. Again, this is a major driver of the obesity epidemic uh, throughout the United States. Uh, for, uh, for those of you who are into Kevin Hall's modeling work at NIDDK, this 200 calories per day extra of sugary beverages will lead to, over a two, three year period, an extra 20 pounds. Um, that's a lot of extra weight. Um, this drives a lot of the obesity epidemic. Now the logic model behind our modeling is fairly straightforward. We have an excise tax that will impact price. And you've heard uh, Xu Wen talk about the impact on price. And it will impact uh, consumption. And we have nice data there. That will impact the BMI and that will impact uh, Dolly's qualities and healthcare cost. Um, as I mentioned, we already have nice data from the project already done in Mexico. Um, we can take a, an estimate of 12% or we could go with 6% or, or somewhere in between. We've uh, looked at a number of different estimates there based on the, uh, with the analysis in the BMJ paper. Um, the relationship between sugar sweetened beverage uh, consumption and BMI is also very well described in the literature randomized trials and change and change studies among both children and adults um, very clearly document how if you change your sugar sweetened beverage intake, you will change your relative gain in weight. Um, this is part of our worldwide literature review. Now, there is an issue around potentially substitution of other beverages. What's nice about the studies we've used those randomized trials, for example, is they take into account any substitution. And there is definite evidence from those studies that there is compensation. So among children, when they are in this double-blind randomized trial in the Netherlands, when they were given a sugary beverage versus not, there was some compensation there. Um, although it's interesting, in some unpublished results, um, there's a sense that it's probably less for the population that has higher rates of obesity. Um, uh, similarly, the change and change analyses for adults indicate a fair amount of uh, compensation. And so we've been using these estimates as we model out the health effects of the change in SSB um, intake over time. If you were to make other assumptions about less compensation, then your results would be different with greater effects. And so that's one of the reasons, as you see different modeling studies, you may see a little different results. Some will be higher, almost like maximum estimates or upper bound estimates, and we consider ours probably a little more realistic. But, um, so we assume a maintenance of the effect over 10 years. We assume this tax is gonna continue for 10 years. And um, we look at uh, long-term outcomes. And uh, it's interesting that the average per person BMI reduction then is not very big. For adults, 0 0.08 BMI units. For children, 0.16 BMI units. Now these don't look very big. These are the estimates that we assume in the US model as well as uh, the Mexico model. For, uh, for the U.S., if you were to implement a sugary beverage excise tax of one cent per ounce across the country at the state level, the impact on the population would be pretty substantial. Uh, probably the biggest number here would be the estimated health care cost saves of $23.6 billion. These results are those published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine this last summer. Um, uh, 100,000 uh, disability adjusted life years saved, 871,000 qualies. Those are big numbers. But they don't come from that big a change in the percentage of the population with obesity. For example, the percentage of children with obesity would change less than 1%. So if the rate of obesity in the US was 18%, it would drop to just around 17, but just above there. It's a small change but big population health effects because so many millions of people are affected. And that's what we expect to happen in Mexico. But we expect a bit of a smaller effect. So um, in Mexico, the tax rate is this 
roughly 10 percent, whereas in the um, a one cent per ounce tax, like in Berkeley, that's maybe a 16 percent change. We assume that the elasticity estimates will be similar, and there's some uh, some good sense that the Colchero study shows this. Um, and we assume, again, similar compensation. Um, but of course, Mexico has different uh, BMI and disease distributions. And the hardest thing for us right now is those health care costs. Um, but we assume small changes will happen. We expect that will happen with the Mexico model. So um, as I said, there's strong evidence that the tax has already led to a reduction in consumption and greater reduction among low-income populations. So the other thing we've done in our modeling work is we started uh, to model out the, the impact on uh, disparities. And to the extent that you have greater consumption among lower-income populations or a greater reduction, this means that this tax will reduce inequities in the outcomes associated with the uh, sugar-sweetened beverage. So we expect small but meaningful shifts in BMI across the population and changes in obesity rates. And the results then should be, uh, 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 provide, I think, very useful guidance for policymakers. Okay, thank you. Now Mauricio is going to tell us what all this means. Well. Um, Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. I, I want to start uh, thanking uh, Xu Wen and Lin and Steve for sharing their presentations and for the great work that you've been doing presenting the, the, the results. So um, it, it's hard to summarize uh, everything, but I, I'll, I'll try. And if I take too long, just ring the bell so I, so I can stop. Well, it's clear that we are eating too much sugar, and, and that uh, that sugar is bad for for our health. Uh, consuming too much sugar uh, in foods and, and drinks uh, can lead to overweight and uh, health problems like obesity and diabetes, and that's particularly uh, problematic in in Mexico. Um, Treating obesity and its consequences imposes a very important burden uh, for health sectors. It is, as we saw, estimated that uh, a person living with obesity incurs in 30% increase in, in medical costs or medical expenditures. And, and this is being seen as a threat to the um, long-term sustainability of, of the health sector. Uh, again, uh, U.S. and Mexico are facing similar borders. Uh, in many parts of the world, uh, sugar intakes uh, for population are uh, higher than uh, recommended, from 12 to 20 percent. And uh, now uh, uh, we have uh, a clear guideline from WHO, finally, which is very important that less the sugar shouldn't be more, no more than 10% of the total energy intake. And there is a print in there that says that it has to go down to 5%. So it, there, that's a clear mandate from, from WHO. However, food is more available, uh, it's heavily marketed, it's promoted, and certainly is, is, is cheaper than previous before. And uh, this has led to a uh, uh, big problem about uh, consumption of sugary sweetened uh, drinks. And there's also another problem, which is that we do not adjust uh, very well, the humans, for the increasing liquid caloric intake. So that makes uh, particularly uh, important for, for public health. So I think, uh, as we saw, uh, fiscal policies have a very legitimate uh, place in the interventions that we uh, that we use, and uh, I think uh, the data that have been shown here are very, very, very important, uh, particularly perhaps for Mexico, which uh, we have the highest rates of obesity and diabetes. We are in obesity; we are second below the U.S. But in diabetes, we are much more high. 
Uh, one thing is we might not be surprised by the results. No? If you increase the price, then the consumer goes. But having this data, having this empirical data at hand, is very, very important. Uh, this uh, confirmation, I think, is uh, very important for, for public health and for governments, which are uh, using these tools as uh, public health interventions. Why? Because we have a very reactive industry. We saw it uh, very clearly in the San Francisco, uh, in the Berkeley slides, sorry. And second, uh, in Mexico, uh, there has been a very, very uh, active lobbying by, by industry. Uh, Suwen commented that there were three papers published by the industry who find, well, not published, they're, they're, they're they are distributed in drafts, uh, white literature or gray literature. But she says that they found exactly the same results, which is true. But what do you read in the newspapers in Mexico? That these very prestigious researchers find no results of the tax and that the uh, paper published in the BAMJ <laughs> is wrong. Uh, so so if, if this uh, uh, were going there, out there, so this data, are, are, are very, very key. Obviously, we need to expand the research. We have the basic parts, and, and this was already mentioned by the, by the presenters, is uh, how can we target better these uh, taxes to move the consumers to uh, more healthy diets? How can we uh, find what's the best uh, tax uh, quantity not to create a, a disaster uh, in terms of uh, uh, hardship among certain groups. And I think uh, we, with the models in Mexico, we, we are going to be good to, in a good position to answer and to provide these uh, uh, answers. Uh, taxes are, 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 are not simple tools, as economists say. I am an epidemiologist, so I'm always to raise in taxes. And, but um, they're, they're not simple tools. They, they need to take it uh, very, very serious. So increasing, what we saw is that increasing the unit of price of sugary beverages, it really is effective in decreasing uh, uh, consumption. Uh, and, and I think the reaction of the industry uh, well is because it's effective. If, if it was not effective, they won't be reacting. They will be very happy. You know? so, so industry is giving us also a clue. That's also similar to the tobacco industry. That when every time the tobacco industry was opposed to a public health measure, it was because that's the best proof that it was effective. Forget about the publication in the BMJ. That's, that was like <laughs> it is effective. <laughs> well, it, this tax has benefits to society. Yes, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced, and, and the data suggests that. Um, Houses who decrease their sugary beverages might have a lower uh, prevalence of obesity, and then they might be decreasing uh, uh, their pocket medical expenses. So this is, this is uh, very, very important. There are differences in, in how the taxes are, are being used, and this is also something that we, we, we need to send out the message. In, in Berkeley, the taxes are being directed to obesity prevention, to food and nutrition programs. In Mexico, the taxes are going to the general revenue of uh, the government, which is a big problem because it might be a danger that uh, you have a good source of, of income uh, linked to a bad or not healthy behavior, and then you don't want as a government to decrease that uh, source of income because you are depending on that, on that source of income. So that's, I think, one of the problems that we may be facing in Mexico and one of the, of the criticism. And, and we need to, to do better in terms of redirecting this tax. Civil society in Mexico make a big effort to redirect a certain proportion of this tax to Mexican schools uh, because in Mexico, a little bit uh, over 60% of schools do not provide free potable water to their students. There are no fountains, there is no infrastructure. So uh, civil society uh, press very hard and they reach an agreement and it's written in the law that certain proportion of the tax would go to this, which is very good because then it's another 
good intervention because kids drink soda or sugary beverage in schools because they don't have access to potable water. However, this has not yet happened. It's stuck in the in the in the in the bureaucracy. One uh, worry that uh, industry always uh, says is that uh, this type of, of taxes might be regressive that may put a hardship among low income groups and them uh, impact. Well, the, the, data, the data presented here uh, for, for Mexico that's stratified by, by uh, uh, SES group shows that the, uh, res the response was higher among, among low income. So, so if we see it from the point of view of the impact uh, that this may have in the health of this group, well, we, we might uh, conclude that this is a, a progressive public health policy because these groups will receive a larger benefit. They will be decreasing the risk of diabetes, they will be decreasing their risk of, of obesity. Now, if we are able to convince the Mexican government to redirect part of this money to these uh, say low-income households that are contributing the most uh, proportionally uh, in terms of, of their income, then we will have, I think, a win-win situation because the tax will be most, more just, more <coughs> equitative because we are returning to these households. And, and that's something that uh, we, we, we need to, to, to work in, in Mexico to, to I mean, avoid this, this, uh, this criticism. Um, and, I, and I think uh, it's something which is uh, to be learned from the Berkeley. Uh, uh, other message that uh, the, this is, uh, is, is given by this tax, and that's a problem, for, for example, for causality in terms of what we are looking here, is that the government sent a big message saying, well, sugary beverages are not healthy, and this might uh, have uh, uh, an impact, uh, and maybe it's not the tax, it's the message. However, in Mexico, uh, the tax was a surprise. I mean, there was a lot of discussion, but in, 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 in news, but I, I don't think it really sent out a message to the Mexicans that the government was worried about their health and they should be uh, switching to another type of, of, of liquids. Um, however, in Berkeley, it seems that there was a big campaign by the industry and probably the message went pass, pass by. But uh, I will say that might be a problem of causality in Berkeley, but not in Mexico. So, so that adds to the value of, this, of, of, of the results. But indeed, it's, it's, a, it's a good message that uh, it can be passed. Now, uh, taxes are good, we saw, but we don't have to move out of the focus that these are not silver bullets, that the taxes are not going to result the complexity of the problem of, of, of obesity. They, they can uh, generate funds to improve the work we are doing, and that will be, maybe then we will be turned into a silver bullet, no? because we then are getting the funds we need to do things. Uh, we need to, to continue doing things in, in our flu, food, food supplies. We, we have to do changes in, in, in the environment and, and, and training for, for local action. Uh, we know children are heavily exposed to a high uh, volume of marketing and that this marketing definitely affects choices. And so we need to move forward to regulate that, that, that environment. We know and we saw in Mexico, and maybe Lou, you can, you can comment a little bit, how industry respond with uh, price promotions uh, and how they were mining the effect of the tax by doing certain uh, price promotions in terms of, of, of volume uh, uh, and things. And we know uh, that um, these uh, promotions increase the, the purchase rate and that uh, many families increase their calories not because they want, just because there is a promotion and then they increase uh, uh, the, the calories. Uh, the food supply, uh, uh, it can also be inter, uh, uh, intervened 
if, uh, and I, I've said this in Mexico, if the industry is so concerned about the, the tax, they could have many years before this tax was enacted, decrease the sugar content of, of their beverages, but they're not doing anything. No? They are opposing the tax, but they are not uh, turning into a healthy or more healthy, or I know the term is, I think is healthy for you foods here, the use in the US. In Mexico, they are unhealthy for you drinks. So, so that is not happening. Uh, they are opposing, uh, and, and uh, they are opposing because this intervention is now being used in many in many other other countries. So, we we can uh, uh, support a program for reformulation to to reduce uh, sugar sugar levels and so on. So, I, I think the, I'm just I'm ready. I'm, re I'm done. <laughs> Uh, the data presented here suggests that uh, countries that have already taken action or, or, or uh, counties, you know, countries or counties, uh, uh, that the price increase uh, by taxation, taxation can uh, influence uh, purchasing of sugary sweetened drinks and other, and other products, products that uh, it is uh, uh, a big impact for public health. However, uh, I want to conclude saying that we need really to address the whole spectrum of interventions and don't think that uh, these taxes are going to be solved with the problem. That's a false uh, expectation. So thank you very much and I congratulate the presenters. It was really great talk. Thank you very much. So that's who's in front of you. Are there any questions? So, Lorraine, be a good role model. Come to the um, microphone. Say, say your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Sure. Um, I'm Lorraine Ritchie, and I'm from the Nutrition Policy Institute at the University of California. I actually have two questions. Can I ask two? You can. Um, so my f first question is for Lynn. And Lynn, you talked about the fact that the stores were not losing money because people were buying more of healthy beverages. So can you tell us a little bit more about what those healthy beverages were and what were the big winners in terms of the healthy beverages in, for the sales? And then my other question is, I don't know if it's to Shuen or, or Mauricio, but um, given the fact that Mexico also passed a tax on quote unquote junk food, do we have any data to show the impact of that tax? Great questions. And do we need um, Lynn to come to the microphone? Or is she okay? Thank you, Lorraine. That's a great question, and I'm going to disappoint you uh, because, as it says, this is preliminary interim six-month analysis, and we um, do not yet have available uh, for dissemination the more refined analyses of which products and what exactly, and milk versus juice versus soda, et cetera. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer your second question. So with regards to junk food tax um, evaluation, there is a paper right now that's being reviewed um, in a journal that my, that my colleagues are working on. Lindsay smith Daly and Carolina Batiste um, are hopefully going to have a publication out soon on the junk food tax. <laughs> so the answer, the answer, Lorraine, is stay tuned. OK. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, and your question. Yeah. Uh, Dan Tabor, University of Texas School of Public Health. Um, I'm really curious to get your perspective on something. As I'm sure you're all aware, the UK recently announced that they were going to pursue a tax. And from what I've read so far, that their scheme is going to be a little bit different, where they're going to have a tier system, where there's going to be different levels of tax based on the amount of sugar in the beverage, which I think is different from both Mexico and Berkeley. So I'm really curious to get everybody's opinion on whether is that a better approach? Is that worse? It, it seems like a reasonable idea when I hear it, but I don't know if there's any research on it. So just I'm curious what you guys think. Go ahead, Joanne. Start in 2018. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to start April of 2018, I believe. Um, so actually, I'm, I think it's a reasonable idea as well. But I think a big piece of it is sort of what the different tiers are, where, how they're coming over the cut points, and also um, the amount, the level of the tax for each of the different tiers. Um, I, I think it's still sort of in discussion. There have been some talk about like 16 pence per, uh, for, for beverages. Is it 
I think 16 pence per liter for the um, for the lower tier amount sugar amounts, and then for the higher tiered ones, it's 24 pence per liter. Um, I think I haven't seen, I haven't looked for actually. That might it might be out there. Um, studies looking at the price elasticities of demand for sugar sweetened beverages in the UK to understand what that might translate to potentially. Um, so you know, I think there needs to be some work looking at sort of how the what these levels are given the context of consumption levels right now in the UK. Yeah. I, I, I. I think in, in theory, it, it's a good idea because uh, you m press industry to move uh, down and to bring down the categories. In, in Mexico, they try to change the, uh, the one peso tax in something like that. However, they decide to uh, on tax a certain level of, uh, uh, of sugar content. The problem was that that level was really uh, selecting proportionally much more drinks that were designed for children. So essentially, the tax was going to be removed from uh, sugary drinkers that were really marketed for, for children. So, so it, it has to be uh, a careful decision in terms of what's the market uh, for. So, so to avoid this uh, unproportionally targeting low tax for drinks to children. I'd add one comment, too. Um, we, we've considered that in a number of places where we looked at soda taxes. I think one consideration at the city level, it's hard to do. It's, it's more complex tax administration. If you're talking about a large state or, or nation, it's pre it, it would be feasible. So in Berkeley, I think, for example, it would have been difficult um, to administer that, and it wouldn't have had an impact on reformulation. So it depends on, on where you are. Um, the SWEET Act that uh, Congresswoman DeLauro put forth last year also looked at a, ref at, at a similar approach, so um, consistent with the UK's. And again, I think the most important thing is where you set the levels. Thank you. Thanks. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Hannah Lohman with the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Oh. Also considering very exciting the issue. Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, so um, I had two questions too. One was around um, for Steve around some of the literature that suggests some of the health benefits from the taxes on how the the taxes are spent on programming. Um, so I was wondering since that may not be the case in Mexico if it's not being implemented or specified for certain purposes how that was accounted for and and the difference that you might expect here. And then the second question was around evaluation, because I'm doing a lot of thinking about that now, obviously, um, <laughs> around if folks had thought about if it might be feasible to do something like a longitudinal cohort study with purchasing like receipts or things like that to um, think about you know, a different type of data to contribute to the evaluation work and what folks' thoughts are around feasibility of that. Great. So Steve, you want to start? <coughs> okay. With respect to the first question, actually none of the modeling work we do um, assumes any effects of the use of the tax money well, for anything. All of those healthcare cost offsets are just because of reduced healthcare ex expenditures because of reduced rates of obesity. Um, it's a good question though. I mean, and I think um, uh, uh, Mauricio raised the more general issue of what happens when the taxes are raised and where does the money go? Um, well, there's clear evidence that if you say the money will be earmarked for children, that it'll boost um, the interest in the tax. And yet the question is, how do you really use that money, and how can that be captured? And I guess that's for the rest of the folks uh, to talk about. But the longitudinal data, I mean, that's what the uh, study that Xuan worked with used. And an interesting issue, though, is will that data still be available? I don't know if you want, you or wanted to talk about that. No, forget about that. Uh, it's uh, will it be made available? But uh, that's what they did use. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can speak briefly. So the, the the data we used in the Mexico study was household panel, um, and so <clears throat> a large proportion of the household stayed in the in the data set for the 
you know, continuous, continuously. Um, and some of the work that we're, we're working on right now, looking at the high versus low consumers, for example, is based on a data-driven approach to classify households um, in terms of the trajectory of their consumption over time and see how they're changing over time with their consistently high purchasing household, SSB purchasing households and, or low, and you know, if they stay, you know, how, how they change with, as the text came in. Um, yeah, and I, I missed the beginning of your talk, sorry. Um, yeah, that's fine. And was that, um, <clears throat> how was, was that self-reported purchasing or? Yeah, yeah, okay. so this is all commercial, you know, um, marketing level, marketing data from the Nielsen Company okay. that, um, you know, had households participate and report their purchases over time. Yeah, I was wondering about kind of individual level, um, you know, receipts and things like that, which seems, you know, difficult implementation wise, but. It is scanner data. Yeah, so this yeah. is all scanner. Okay. But, but kids don't buy that much of the household. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Great, thank you. Tell us your name and where you're from and your question. Hi, I'm Jesse Green. I'm a doctoral student at Arizona State University. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was um, very enlightening. Um, I have two questions as well. Um, the first one goes to the um, attempt for other policies in, in different states. And, and really, it's just on, is it pretty standard to see a taxation on um, per ounce? Um, my concern would be we see a very similar type of um, um, trend in cereal. So we had a, a sugar in cereal and trying to decrease the sugar in cereal. And we saw a response from the industry was just to change the portion size from a cup to a, a third of or three fourths of a cup. So that overall sugar was under 10 grams per serving. So I don't, I want to see if that's pretty standard to do it um, per ounce because hopefully that would be so that we don't have a workaround. So I don't, I don't know if you know deep into the details of the other policies that have been um, proposed yet. Lynn, you want to take? Um, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the most part, it's been per ounce. There have been places that have based it on, on the value of the sale, as Shu Wen mentioned in her presentation, the Ad Valorem Texas, is that correct? Um, I'm a pediatrician, not an economist, but um, the, um, I believe, I'm not 100% certain, but I believe Deloro's bill used grams of sugar. Okay. Is that correct? Yeah, I, th I think it was grams of sugar. So uh, grams of sugar, if, if you put it over a standard denominator, like per cup, uh -huh. is okay too, if you, but as long as you write it in a way that can't be played by the portion size okay. um, being reset. Okay. Um, so there's a few different ways um, to do it. And there's many ways. Um, CSBI, for example, had been mm -hmm. petitioning the FDA to reduce the concentration of sugar in allowable and soft drinks for many years, which would be an alternative approach to taxation. But I think decades later, we still haven't gotten an answer. Um, similarly, reducing portion size could reduce exposure. But right now, it looks like taxation is the one that we've been able to pass somewhere. And then my second question, um, is there any um, plans for research for um, tracking reformulation? Um, so I know that's down the line and this is still very new, especially with implementation in the US, but potential reformulation among the industry to see what products might emerge or how products are gonna be changing over time. Do you wanna take that one? Can say something about it. Um, yeah, so you know, it is possible to do some of this work. It's not gonna be comprehensive, unfortunately, I think, because right now, sort of the availability of data that monitors changes in the formulation of products is not complete. Um, in this country, and the U.S., I think, is particularly challenging because it's such a huge market. Um, you know, the products that are available in one part of the country is completely different from, can be very different from products available in another part of the country. Even the same product in one part of the country and another part of the country can actually vary in its formulation. So there are those sort of challenges to consider. Um, it's not impossible to do, but it's, you know, and I think increasingly we're going to be able to do this and track the formulations of products. Um, but it's, it's very tedious. If you look at the work that's going on on salt and monitoring reformulation on salt, it's actually a very good model for doing that. Um, and countries all around the world and the National Salt Reduction Initiative in the U.S. are using, they looked through Nielsen, for example, at the top 80% of sales and the products represented and have monitored reformulation um, that way. So I, I do think it's feasible. Somebody has to do it. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's possible. Many answers. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so just, just to mention that in, in the tax for junk food in Mexico was based in caloric density. So everything which was above 240 got taxed. So that's definition of junk food. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, sir, come on up. This is the physical activity. Yeah, I, I think we just each burned a quarter of a calorie. Uh, this is a related issue, which is back to the health effects. Um, one thing, as I mentioned, you know, if you have the effects of, let's say, the tax in Mexico or a sugar sweetened beverage tax in Berkeley or in a few states or cities in the United States change the prevalence of obesity by, let's say, half a percent over uh, a few years. You know, so uh, for children, you know, a change from 19 percent to 18 percent or something. Um, we won't be able to detect that with our current surveillance systems. So be ready for those articles that say obesity rate didn't change in this city because of this intervention or this state. I mean, it's a small change, but it's a very cost-effective intervention, and it's a good start, and I think like, we should just be ready for that. This might be our last question. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, Claudio Neg with the University of Hawaii. Um, we've also tried last year. Unfortunately, we failed. Uh, our legislators uh, were more influenced by business, I guess. But um, I, I come back to just kind of what we addressed at the end here. Uh, when we look at the costs and the really magnitude of your um, uh, explorations and your modeling, uh, when we go back to the infectious disease, uh, the, uh, what what happened with, uh, um, you know, eradicating malaria, for example, the cost, medical cost reductions dwarf in comparisons with the numbers that you're throwing around. Um, I'm wondering what the health system is doing in terms of taking notice of really you know, the amount of uh, effort that's going on with, say, dengue fever or something like that, whereas the cost of dengue fever or cost of case of dengue fever versus the cost of case of diabetes, uh, they're not comparable. There's orders of magnitude where diabetes is way higher. So I'm wondering if there's anything going on at that level. So you're saying we'd make more progress if sugary beverages were delivered by mosquito instead of... <laughs> <laughs> Any any comment? <laughs> Our media studies person gets the tagline for the news article. <laughs> Do you want to comment, Steve? Yeah. So um, I do think it's really important to talk about not just the potential impact, but then the cost of the interventions. And we've actually, in our choices work, have looked at maybe 43 different childhood obesity interventions that cross over into adulthood interventions uh, for a lot of them too. And I do think that as we've looked across them and looked for the best money for value in intervention work, a sugar sweetened beverage excise tax just stands right out there as kind of a total no-brainer. You'll save money in a range of ways. And in addition to all that and reducing obesity, um, you'll bring in dollars that could be spent on other programming. Um, it just means that in the healthcare system here in this country, we need to start doing that same sort of thing with our different treatments to look at the relative value for money of different treatments. And right now, that is not really being very well promoted in the United States. It, it's actually embarrassing that it's, people say don't do it um, in a range of different ways. So I think start to cost out interventions and look at their effects, their population impact, their cost and their cost effectiveness so that we have more data to use. As we've been working with different states on our choices projects, um, we found it very bipartisan. Everybody's interested in best value for money. So I think it's a good point. Yes, you may. I guess what, what you just commented is very important, and, and that has to do with this issue of health in all policies, because 
The health sector is, is mostly focused on, on treating in, and in, uh, trying to cope with the uh, tsunami of diabetes in, in, in Mexico. And it has no leverage over the real determinants, no? like, like the fiscal policy, like uh, how uh, food are sold and advertised. So, so it's, it's very important what you mentioned to, to bring the other sectors, economy, agriculture, uh, treasury, into uh, real health in all policies to control uh, this, this problem. So I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mauricio. Thank you to the country of Mexico for making that big change and for the city of Berkeley so that we have something to measure, to say, yes, Steve's right, this works. And I think it's up to all of us now to be sure to let our colleagues know, to let the world know, and to see that healthy future that we want in every single policy that comes forward. Thank you to Encore, to all of you here, all of you listening on the web. Thank you to Tracy Orleans at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who was part of the brains behind putting this panel together in the first place. And um, enjoy your water. Thank you very much. <laughs>